Very few aircraft entering military service in 1914 would still be in the air by 1918, let alone in use by one of the major powers for active combat. Yet the Royal Aircraft Factory FE-2 accomplished just that feat, and remained one of the British pilot's favorite aircraft up to the very last day of its service. FE-2's origins are a rather confusing one, as the Royal Aircraft Factory technically had a total of three aircraft with the same name, all designed by Geoffrey de Havilland. The first one, developed in 1911, was named after the Farman brothers who had designed the unique pusher-style design the aircraft would have, and gained the name Farman Experimental II. The Farman Experimental I had been built in 1910. The second version of the FE-2 would contain several major changes and take flight in 1913. This all culminated in the final design being flown in 1914, sharing only the Farman layout as its sole relationship with the two that came before it. It ended up looking closer to the Vickers FB-5 gun bus than the original 1911 design. Why they didn't completely redesignate the name is anybody's guess. A two-seater, it had the pilot seat in the back, with the no seat being for the observation gunner, who would have at his disposal a forward-facing 303 Lewis gun mounted on a witch's broomstick, which gave it a wide field of fire. An improvement made to the overall design was the addition of two nose gear wheels, which helped with the preventing a common nose-over accident of the time, an accident that is still prevalent in tail-dragger aircraft to this day. Initially powered by a Beardmore 120 horsepower engine, Britain would order 12 of the FE-2A variant upon the outbreak of the First World War. This was before it had even done its first flight. By 1914, pusher aircraft were already obsolete aerodynamically. However, the British military saw the clear field of fire allowed to the machine gun as a good enough reason to keep the aircraft in production. Just as deliveries of these were being made, the Royal Aircraft Factory began producing the main production model, the FE-2B. This updated aircraft had the older 120-horsepower Beardmore engine replaced with a 160-horsepower upgrade, allowing it to reach speeds of 147 kilometers per hour, or 91 miles per hour, and have a total weight of 1378 kilograms, or 3,037 pounds with its empty weight being around 935 kilograms or 2,061 pounds. This allowance of around 400 kilograms gave it ample ability to fly two pilots fully fueled with headroom for bombs and other extra equipment. This also allowed for a second Lewis gun to be added on a telescopic mount, originally for use by the pilot to shoot over the observer's head. However, it was quickly repurposed by the observers when they learned it would give them the ability to fire at almost any aircraft on the FE-2's tail. Frederick Libby, an observer aboard the, an FE-2B who would go on to become one of America's aces of the war, would describe it as such. When you stood up to shoot, all of you from the knees up was exposed to the elements. There was no belt to hold you. Only your grip on the gun and the sides of the nacelle stood between you and eternity. Toward the front of the nacelle was a hollow steel rod with a swivel mount to which the gun was anchored. The gun covered a huge field of fire forward. Between the observer and the pilot, a second gun was mounted for firing over the FE-2B's upper wing to protect the aircraft from rear attack. Adjusting and shooting this gun required that you stand right up out of the nacelle with your feet on the nacelle's combing. You had nothing to worry about except being blown out of the aircraft by a blast of air or tossed out bodily if the pilot made a wrong move. There were no parachutes and no belts. No wonder they needed observers. The FE-2B would make immediate and lasting changes to the air war on the Western Front. With its flexible deployment from observer to ground attacker to fighter, it was able to help turn the tide of the Fokker Scourge after the death of Max Immelmann, a kill credited to the 25th Squadron's FE-2Bs. Further experiments to make improvements were done, and the FE-2C was born as a possible night fighter. However, only two were made, and production eventually moved on to the FE-2D, the last production model of the aircraft, with 386 built. The Beardmore engine was swapped out with the new Rolls-Royce Eagle, a 250 horsepower engine. However, it did little to improve the maximum speed beyond the 10 extra miles per hour gained at 5,000 feet. It did, however, improve the payload, allowing for more Lewis guns or more bombs. Even more experimental changes were made to various FE-2s, 
with two such aircraft being fitted with a 150 horsepower RAF-5 engine, and another four were also made into the FE-2H in 1918, fitted with a 230 horsepower Sinali Puma and a six-pounder Davis gun for ground attacks. By the autumn of 1916, the FE-2D had become completely outclassed by the new German Albatross and Halberstadt fighters. This led to the FE-2B being fully replaced as a fighter with the Bristol F-2B by April 1917. However, the FE-2B was kept as a tactical night bomber in conjunction with the few remaining frontline FE-2D models. Even though severely outclassed, they still proved to be difficult aircraft to bring down. In fact, it was an FE-2D that nearly killed Manfred von Richthofen in June of 1917, giving him a head injury that likely contributed to his death in April of 1918. The squadrons would eventually formulate defensive formations, with single-seat fighters working together with the now tactical night bomber FE-2s in order to form some of the first Lufberry circles, in which the gunner of each aircraft was able to cover the blind spots of the others, allowing for multiple gunners to fire at the same enemy attacking the group. Many times, squadrons of FE-2s were able to fight their way out from far behind enemy lines under constant attack from enemy aircraft. By the end of the war, a total of 860 would eventually be fully converted into bombers. The FE-2B would also serve as an excellent Zeppelin killer, as well as a few being used to hunt down and sink U-boats around the mouth of the Thames River and the Isle of Grain. Although they weren't very effective in this role, Britain suffered from fuse issues and many of the bombs dropped on German U-boats would just never explode. By 1919, all 1,939 FE-2s were retired from service. In all, a total of 48 pilot aces and 20 observer aces would fly the FE-2 for both Britain and America during the war, with one aircraft being sent to Australia as a trainer. Another 35 were converted into Victor's instruction machines and sent to China as a trainer aircraft. It is not known how long they were used before also being removed from service. However, it might be safe to assume that at least a couple remained in active service in China as a trainer aircraft up until the early 1930s when Japan invaded. There is currently one surviving FE-2 known, which is now on display at the Royal Air Force Museum in London. Two replicas do exist, with one being airworthy and fitted with an original Beardmore engine. Both of these replicas were manufactured by the Vintage Aviator of New Zealand, a company which makes replica World War I aircraft. Currently, they aren't taking orders due to the problematic supply chains caused by COVID. However, there appears to be plans to restart retail production of their aircraft, so if you've got money to burn, that might be an option for you. Thank you guys for listening to this video. I really appreciate all the support. Hopefully this is the start of more constant uploads, although every single time I say that, I, see, I tend to taper off due to other things becoming busy. Um, if you guys like the video, feel free to comment, like it, um, or subscribe if you haven't already to keep up with uh, future uploads and all that. Um, hopefully I can just keep on improving in terms of the quality of both the video and the audio and the writing content as it's just a continuous learning curve for me and just kind of getting back into the rhythm since it's been so long. Thank you guys and I uh, hope to see you in the next one.